Hello, it's Gabby here from Confidence After Cancer, and I hope this finds you well. I've got a really interesting guest for you this week, um, somebody that I've met online, Emily, but I've spoken to her a few times and got a little bit of an idea about the sort of work that she does. As she is a really interesting guest. I'll tell you a little bit about her background before we uh, get to meet Emily. So Emily Patricia Fay is an AUD. HD woman and I hope I've said that correctly because this is an area I don't know very much about. She is a woman and an energetic home healer dedicated to empowering neurodivergent minds. As a Conmarie consultant, ADHD autism organising specialist and a feng shui consultant in training, Emily brings a holistic approach to her transformative work. Her experience in feng shui allows her to harness the power of energy flow in living spaces, amplifying the positive impact on her client's well-being. With a background in mental health support, coaching and counselling and support work, Emily's journey is guided by a deep understanding of the unique challenges faced by neurodivergent individuals. She skillfully combines her organising prowess with her compassionate approach, providing tailored solutions that ensure effective implementation and sustainable results. Emily is committed to nurturing spaces that not only declutter, but soothe the minds of her clients, creating environments where they can flourish and thrive. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Through her empowering guidance, Emily empowers neurodivergent mums and their families to enhance their mental well-being by transforming their living and working spaces, embracing the principles of calmness and harmony. Her clients find solace and strength in her care as they discover the magic of calm spaces and calm minds. You can experience the profound effect of Emily Patricia's phase work and embark on a transformative journey that fosters lasting peace and serenity in your life. Now I'm reading that from her bio that she sent through to me, just explaining a little bit about what she's doing and whether you know any of that resonates with you. I think most of us could do with a little bit more calm and serenity in our lives. I'm a huge fan of feng shui, I have been for quite some time and I know for myself the absolute uh, mental clarity that I get after a good uh, decluttering session so I know the benefits of that but I'm sensing Emily's work goes a lot deeper than that and some of the clients that she works with who have very specialist needs maybe find that combined with the other treatments that they're having they can experience a real transformation so I'm really excited to speak to Emily this week on this podcast and talk to her a little bit more about her work and what she does. And for all of us, you know, whether we've got a diagnosis of any of the things that I've just uh, mentioned before, as I say, we could all do with a little bit more peace and harmony in our lives, maybe. And just feeling a little bit more in control. I, that's what I'd like to get out of this session. I'd like to speak to Emily and think, yeah, there's areas of my life that I've got, I think I've pretty sorted. But areas that I'm still working on, maybe some of what she's got to share with us could help. So listen in now, I'm going to introduce Emily in a minute and let's see you uh, with Emily in a minute. So welcome Emily, it's so good to see you today. Thank you. Great to have you here on the podcast. So I've, I've told our listeners a little bit about you and your background but I'd really like to hear from you um, if you can tell us a little bit about your story and how you've ended up doing the work that you're doing. Absolutely, so I have always struggled with um, my mental health. I was diagnosed with depression at 16 and put on medication until I was in my early 30s. And I came off medication then and chose to journey on a path to a more natural way of supporting myself. During that time, I also went on a journey of rediscovering myself because having been on medication for so long, I had lost who I was a little bit, um, understanding who I was, particularly as I went on it at such a young age. So I I started on a process of self-discovery at that point. I also then, shortly after, fell pregnant with um, my first daughter. I had a bit of a traumatic introduction to the world of motherhood and my daughter was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia um, at the age of nine months 
she she wasn't given a very good chance of survival but she is turning nine next month and she's doing really well and she's a miracle case which I am super super proud of but from there I had a bit of a catalogue of traumatic events so shortly after that diagnosis found out I was pregnant with my second daughter and then just before she was born and just after Imogen had um, come out of hospital my mum tragically passed away very suddenly in quite traumatic circumstances and I was her only daughter it had only ever been the two of us so it was quite a big shock to the system for me mm-hmm. she'd been our main support through everything through all of Imogen's treatment as well so yeah so I had this huge catalogue of traumatic events which then pushed me even further into a healing journey and I started um, looking at other ways to support myself. I was using a lot of homeopathy, essential oils, batch flower remedies. I did a lot of energetic healing, a lot of trauma healing. Um, I really connected with myself and as part of that journey I actually went through the process of further being diagnosed over the years i had been diagnosed with several things like complex anxiety disorder chronic depression all sorts of different mental health um, conditions as they tried to work out what was going on with me and what i actually discovered and sought a diagnosis for was autism and adhd and my world really changed for the better with those diagnoses because i suddenly had an understanding of myself of why i had always felt a little on the the outskirts of society um struggling to fit in in places struggling with foods with um sounds and things with connecting with people and suddenly all of the therapies and things that I was doing started to work a little better because I had this understanding of myself and I suddenly was able to let go of a lot of the barriers and the masks that I'd built up over the years to create Mm -hmm. this version of myself that actually wasn't who I who I am and what I then went on to do I carried on with this self-development road and and I've been doing lots of different books and I then discovered The Magical Art of Tidying Up Marie Kondo book and what I discovered was this was like the missing part of my healing journey so I'd done a lot of inner work a lot of finding out about myself how inwardly I worked and I hadn't addressed my physical space, the physical space that I was in. Mm -hmm. And as I started to do that, I was suddenly, it opened up a whole world of understanding of how much our physical space really impacts our well-being. And we can do all the inner work um, that we want, but actually without doing some of the outer work, we are directly impacting the ability for that inner work to really resonate and really like connect and and do that that final part of healing so I went through the whole process and 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 fell in love with it really and I just realized how many people have a lack of understanding about the impact of our spaces and so that's what has led me to really go on this journey of building my business up to support people in that way because the impact can be huge and um, when our homes are supporting and nurturing us in the way that that they can do then we really have the ability to heal ourselves on a deeper level love that absolutely love that and i i talked before in my my, one of my other podcasts about one of the things that i struggled with was sleep for a long time i couldn't sleep very well and one of the things that really helped me was decluttering my bedroom and getting it into a really calm so you know my house isn't always most tidy or everything perfect but my bedroom that's my priority because i know if my bedroom's cluttered i don't sleep as well and it's crazy isn't it but the effect that, that things like that can have on us is really profound yeah Yes, absolutely. And one of the first places that I like to talk to people about is how their bedrooms are, because mm-hmm. sleep, as you say, is um, it's the foundation to our health in general, physically, mentally. And lack of that is just devastating to us, really. So, yeah, absolutely. Decluttering your bedroom and keeping that a really calm and nurturing space is so important. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely love that. It really resonates. And the other thing that's really resonating with what you've just said is the fact that healing happens on so many levels. 
it's not just you know you take a pill and you're better no when there's yeah. a lot of work to do there's a lot of work and sometimes yeah. that'd be quite exhausting can't it you know doing that on your own and thinking well where do I go and I feel you know, I've done that and I feel a little bit better but it's not the answer and that's yes. how I was for many years yeah and that's why I like to work with other people that have been down that path before me that mm -hmm. can share their experience because it's exhausting doing this on your own isn't it gosh it absolutely is and it's one of those things that you know healing we don't ever sort of reach that healed in inverted <laughs> there's always an extra layer of the onion yeah. to peel back <laughs> to really look at but we can get to a point where it is less exhausting Mm -hmm. um, and with a supportive community around you and with people that are really understanding and who, who have, as you say, been on the journey before you, then that really helps you to stay on track and helps you to keep that energy and motivation high. And there's also so many things that you can do for yourself to support that as well, because sometimes we focus so much on the deep inner work as well that can be so exhausting or we're physically so tired from our body fighting whatever needs to be healed mm -hmm. that um we need a break from that type of healing sometimes to kind of put our energies yeah. into something that's a bit more practical that we can see the results of yeah i think there's something for me as well about being in control because when you've got an illness yeah. or a diagnosis and you're listening to the medics who are the experts and trying to follow what they say you sometimes feel like you're on this roller coaster of being swept along by, oh, I'm not sure what to do next. And, and, and being told this is what's going to happen next. I'm not sure. But if something like your environment, you're in control of that, aren't you? And at a time when your life might seem very chaotic and out of control. Yes, absolutely. And if you're having to spend a lot of time in, in hospitals or doctor's surgeries and things like that, when we were living at the hospital for such a long time with Imogen and, and we lived in um, Ronald McDonald House um, for a long time as well, um, so we were close by, and then your home becomes such a, it really needs to be that sanctuary that you come home to. It needs to be a place that is so different from that because the impact yeah. of those spaces is so huge that we need to yeah. ensure our homes are are really supporting us and my connection with with homes really started then because we actually weren't allowed to take her home until certain things were done to our home um it had to be checked for any form of mold or anything and we had mm -hmm. to repaint a lot of the rooms and things oh. because her risk of infection was so high and and many of the children weren't allowed to go back to their homes because they wouldn't have stayed healthy yeah. being in them. So from a physical point of view, keeping your home clean and tidy and things, you know, I ha we had to clean like two or three times a day to really keep on top yeah. of germs and dust and stuff, particularly because she was so young putting everything in her mouth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was um, kids do. So yeah. Even on that level, you know, it, on a physical level of our physical health, the less clutter that you have in your home, the more able you are to keep it uh, an environment that is supporting you physically as well as mentally. Love that. Absolutely love that. I want to go back a little bit. We, you know, I talked in the in introduction about a couple of words that I've used and I'm throwing these words around like I know what they mean and I feel like I don't really <laughs> like you to tell me because I feel a bit, little yeah. bit ignorant. So the first one was neurodivergent and I hear this a lot, but I don't really yeah. know what it means. Yes, yeah, so neurodivergent is um, a term used for a group of diagnoses such as ADHD and autism, but it also encompasses things like complex anxiety disorder, depression, any kind of mental health condition that affects your ability to function in the same way as what they would refer to as neurotypical people in terms of being able to function in society in the way that is expected of us. Okay. So they've changed it from neurodiversity, which they say we're all neurodiverse and neurodivergent um, is more of an explanation of how you are. You're more divergent in the way your brain works than from a wow. neurotypical of view okay. it sounds very complex to me and i'm still struggling a little bit to understand the difference between adhd and autism what are yes. the differences yeah okay so autism i mean i'm not a clinician to be able to um give my full di diagnostic sort of definition but from my point of view my perspective my autism is very much about routine and structure so when you have an autistic brain, you 
think of things in a slightly different way to other people. There's a need, very much a need for order and calm. We think about things in, I mean, to me, it's just the way we think about things, but <laughs> apparently it's in a very different way <laughs> to other people. <laughs> um, and we get very overwhelmed easily. So sensory processing disorder is often very prevalent in people with both autism and, and ADHD because we get very overstimulated very easily. We get very overwhelmed by sounds, by textures, by touch. I get touched out very, very easily. Um, we struggle with making eye contact. We struggle with um, connecting with people sometimes. So we can come across as being quite cold at times. So that's kind of autism. There's, there's often, it's communication can be a real struggle. Yeah. In fact, I had, just before I was diagnosed, I had a breakdown. Um, I was pregnant with my third daughter and I actually couldn't speak or leave my house for three weeks because for me, when I'm very, very stressed and very overwhelmed, the first thing that will shut down is my ability to speak and to communicate. And that's quite common. They, they refer to it as selective mutism, which I struggle with because you don't select to do it, it, it yeah. it's something that you have no control over but a lot of children um struggle with it and it can be a real issue at school in terms yeah, sure. of because they they shut down and it and they struggle to communicate so that's autism adhd and autism really overlap with a lot of the diagnostic criteria but one of the main differences between them is that adhd is a lot of being inattentive and being distracted easily which autism they can tend to be not distracted by things and really like tunnel vision so this is why if you have both you're often the least likely to be diagnosed because they cancel each other out yeah, so sometimes yeah. I can be really in the zone and not distracted and other times I'm like oh shiny object syndrome <laughs> <laughs> and starting 10 projects at once so ADHD has now been split down into three different types of ADHD so there's the hyperactive ADHD and what people generally think of as young boys bouncing off the walls, being absolutely crazy. And then there's inattentive, I think it's inattentive ADHD, where they struggle to have the energy to, yeah. to do much. And then there's combination ADHD where you have, have some of both. The biggest common denominator between the two is executive functioning disorder and rejection sensitive dysphoria um so emotional functioning disorder is when you struggle to do things like just basic self-care and look after yourself oh, remembering yeah. to eat and drink um just being able to carry out daily tasks filling out forms is really difficult all things like that can be really challenging and rejection sensitive dysphoria is that when we feel rejected obviously everyone gets affected by that no one wants to be rejected right it has such an impact on us so it can really really affect your mental health and um, sure. cause quite a lot of trauma i think patience is a really is a really good thing i think it's um changing our expectations of of what yeah what you're needing and thinking am i needing something here or is this person just not giving Mm. Uh, you know are they doing it on purpose or is this my yeah. need to have them respond to me in a certain way I think the key is to ask we actually don't mind being asked I think it's really important because I would never want to speak for yeah. anyone because yeah. everyone's so so different mm -hmm. and the other thing is is that it can be different at different times so I can make eye contact because I've taught myself to do that but also when I'm more comfortable yeah. and confident I can do that but if I'm struggling so what I would say is if it's a if it's a close friend and they're like that perhaps ask how they're doing because we tend to struggle more with things like that when we're struggling with something else yeah. when we're feeling overwhelmed so I think if we're feeling like someone's being a bit cold towards us or something it's thinking mm -hmm. oh how can I support them? What's going on for them at this moment that might be making them feel like that? Because that's what I need in that moment. I just want understanding. I want someone to go, seems like you're really struggling at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to back off for a bit, give you some space. But if you need me, I'm here. 
or tell me that there's something else that you need me to do because it's just wanting to feel understood and most people have often spent time being told that they shouldn't behave the way that they're doing and and all of that so we can be quite worried about our effect on other people which can then cause those symptoms to yeah yeah i can see it's a vicious circle <laughs> so i've learned to manage a lot of my struggles because i work with my cycles now so i work with the lunar cycle uh -huh. and i also yeah. work with my menstrual cycle and i've been monitoring them for quite a while and i know that at different times near the new and full moon and when I'm ovulating and when I'm bleeding I'm actually I've struggled more so I know at those points that I try not to book in like loads of social events at those times yeah. I make sure that I'm around people who understand that I have more space for myself, that I know that I'm going to need more self-care at those times. And it's about that awareness and understanding of yourself and encouraging anyone that you know to, to really connect with that so that then they can share with you the information that they learn so you can then support them. Wow. That's really key, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that as well. And even, you know, other people that I've worked with in the past, particularly women, I've talked about cycles and energy batching and thinking about, you know, think about when you're going to do your big tasks, think about when yeah. you're going to do your physical tasks, your mental tasks. If, mm -hmm. you, if you're keeping a diary and you notice certain patterns, you think, oh, yeah, around that time, I'm always a bit ditzy or I always forget things. And actually, some other days I can really focus and I don't know what's going on. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it, to think about cycles? It really does, yeah. Yes, yeah. And I think that's what's... You hit the nail on the head about feeling like people are inconsistent. That's why I think people um, find it really hard to understand mm -hmm. and relate to. And I think yeah. probably that works as well for people who are unwell, because you have good mm -hmm. days and bad days, right? Yeah. And it can be like, oh, well, you were okay yesterday. So why are you suddenly like got no energy today and you can't come out and do things with me? And, and actually yeah. from moment to moment, it can change. Yes. Whether there's something going on physically or whether there's something going on neurologically, we just need to be more accepting of each other and accepting yeah. of thinking about what might be going on for that person rather than, oh, well, they're not behaving the way I, I need them to be behaving. Yeah. Like They've upset me. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Wow. It's a lot of food for thought then. Absolutely. And, and I know, you know a lot of cancer patients have said that to me. People don't understand. We well, finished your treatment now. So crack on. Yeah, you must be mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so a yeah. lot of people who are neurodivergent have a lot of hidden illnesses as well. So things like fibromyalgia, and it's going to go out of my head to the other ones, but there's a lot of a lot of them. So they have a deep understanding of that as well because there's good days and bad days, and it's an unseen thing. Um, the same as with cancer, people can't necessarily see it, so they don't know what you're struggling with inside. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it was the same with Imogen when she came out of hospital, and people are like, "Oh, she's okay now." Mm. It's like she'd have really bad days she had chronic fatigue for um a really long time and people just didn't understand and they were like oh just push her to do more and it's like she oh. can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's great <laughs> advice that that you don't need isn't it yeah, yeah quite <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i know yes you could write a book about some of the inappropriate things oh gosh yes, yeah. absolutely <laughs> That's really, really interesting. I've got, you've given me a lot of food for thought there, a lot that I'd like to go away and reflect on it because it's it's such a, a deep subject. But I'd yeah. imagine getting a diagnosis is quite difficult. And I'm wondering, you know, what's the percentage of the population that are affected by this that maybe don't even realise that they are? Yeah, yeah. it's it's um, a lot more people than, than we're aware of. But, I mean, there's a lot of people who, who just self-diagnose now because the diagnostic process is so tricky and some people feel like they don't need to have a formal diagnosis which is absolutely yeah, fine for yeah. me it, it, for me it felt really important but I completely respect that for other people it, it, it isn't it is quite a lengthy process these days because so many people are becoming more aware and therefore seeking diagnoses so on the NHS it is quite a long wait and it depends on the area that you're in as to how long that wait is as we know <laughs> with everything with the NHS the the important thing is is finding support. There are a lot of networks out there. There are a lot of groups on Facebook that you can join if, if you're just thinking you might have a neurodivergence. They're, they're very welcoming um, of people who just want to explore that and understand whether they feel like it resonates for them. And, that, and joining those groups is really helpful because being around people that get it and yeah. understand and where you can speak really freely about it mm -hmm. is really, really important as we spoke about 
earlier on about that community aspect and, and being around people that understand it, it's so, so important. For me, I sort of diagnosed this at a good time just before it started getting really bad and it was still a year um, for me right. to, to get an appointment. Yeah. But it's mm. now increased <laughs> significantly. I, um, I think the reason that I've, a lot of people that ask me what my views are on, on thinking, you know, people think it's a trend mm. and that, you know, everyone just is jumping on the bandwagon. And, and I hear a lot as well, you know, oh, we're all a bit neurodiverse, we're all a bit yeah, we're all on the spectrum. And, um, you know, we're all on a spectrum of, diversity absolutely but unfortunately comments like that take away from the fact that um for some of us we need to really understand ourselves um yeah. in terms of um our emotional well-being and saying things like that just really um minimizes the impact of um the diagnosis so and we laugh about it in the community and say that they it's those people only say that because they're actually neurodivergent themselves <laughs> um but yeah. personally i feel that um it's becoming more prevalent because mm -hmm. of the society we live in and taking it back mm -hmm. to our physical spaces because we're so impacted sensory wise on a daily basis within our homes within the technology that we use within the public yeah. spaces that we use within all of the constant 24-hour access to information and things we are yeah. all completely overstimulated and overloaded it's therefore i don't feel like there are more people now than there was before with neurodivergence but there are more people struggling with their divergence because of the society we live in if yeah. you stripped all of that back i think there would be fewer people needing a diagnosis because they would be able to manage the way that they functioned in society in a better way absolutely I, you're absolutely right when you, you reflect back even going like back five years mm. ten years the way that we're living is changing so much and i do worry yeah. you know, i've got grandchildren i worry about all, the social media and the technology yeah. and AI and all these things that we hear about, mm -hmm. what's it doing to their mental health? And I really absolutely I worry about that. I do. Yeah, yeah, I really do. Really, really interesting. So much yeah. stuff that you're giving me there. But I'd really like to go on to you know your business is called Calm Space, Calm Mind. Yes, absolutely love that. And you told me before about is it Kamari? Kamari? That you Kamari, yeah. Consultant? Kamari so, and Feng Shui, which is, you know, a real, always been an interest of mine, Feng Shui. Really, really, like I said, I, I'm really into it. I've got it in my bedroom. So for me, I haven't really got many more questions for you because it's been so interesting listening to your story and your explanations. I've got so much information that I'm going to reflect on a little bit, I think, because it's been really, really useful for me. But if you just talk about your business, you know, how people want to get in touch with you and the sort of work and support that you can offer them. That'll yeah, really cool. absolutely. So, yeah, obviously, as I mentioned, I trained as a KonMari consultant. So I trained with Marie Kondo and I do use her method. I do um, obviously adapt that method because I work predominantly with um, neurodivergent individuals and their families. But I'm not limited to working with those people. But I have such a passion for supporting calm minds as my mm -hmm. the title of my business. Love it. Um, suggests and as I say for me neurodivergence includes any kind of mental health condition which so many people mm -hmm. do struggle with so I not only use the KonMari method but I use feng shui within my work and I am also an energetic home healer so as well as obviously feng shui works with the energies of our home but I work on a deeper level so I use a lot of crystals and I use sage and singing bowls and things and I help to cleanse um, homes on all levels so I say that I work with your home on a physical level on an energetic level and I also work with you on a mindset level so I work on a mental level as well because for me it's all about changing your limiting beliefs around your home and also around the thoughts on cleaning and tidying and organizing because we think of those as chores and uh, when in actual fact they're acts of self-care and yeah. when we change our mindsets and our limiting beliefs around how we tackle those um, tasks we actually can create a connection with our home that's much stronger and much more able to support us on all levels so 
that's how I work. I do a lot of work virtually. I do work in person locally in Hampshire, Dorset and West Sussex, but I work predominantly um, virtually, which works really, really well. So people can contact me via my website, which I presume you'll put all of my links in I'll there. I'll put the links below. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I won't read them all out. But my website and my Instagram, I have a free Facebook community, Calm Space, Calm Mind, which mm-hmm. I share lots of things. And we do things like body doubling sessions, which is a really great way for um people to to get stuff done because they've you've got that accountability so we jump online and we say this is the task we're going to do and we get it done in the time and we and then we come back together and celebrate what we've achieved so it's it's a really great way to really tackle those tasks that you've been putting off (laughs) that Um, sounds wonderful yeah we all need that I do I do yeah yeah i'll be jumping in there thank you i need some accountability i need somebody to give me a little nudge sometimes yeah yeah yeah. please come and join us and then you can obviously work one-to-one with me i do a Mm three-month program and i do have a group program which will be releasing soon and just to mention that i'm going to be at the clean and clean and tidy home show in october 14th and 15th of october and so do jump on my instagram because i'm going to be giving away some tickets and stuff soon um so if um so that's down in london but if people are interested in 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 that it's a really fab show and there's lots of natural cleaning products there and loads of different organizing tips and things so it's a really great place right. really great oh, you're speaking my language about the the, the uh, natural cleaning products yes because that was a big eye-opener for me when i realized mm. how many toxic products i was being exposed to at one point love yeah. everything that you said yeah we'll put all the links below um, and love that calm space calm mind i think that's what everybody needs you know whether you know whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever your background brilliant yeah. work that you're doing it's so lovely to speak to you and as i say Thank my mind is still <laughs> still turning over with you giving me so much information and things to think about that i just hadn't considered before so good to speak to you thank you so much and take care thanks for coming on thank you thank you very thanks much. emily thank you bye well i've just finished my podcast with emily and my goodness my head is spinning i've learned so much from her in the last half an hour um a lot for me to ponder on in my personal life and and the relationship that i've got with somebody but on a general level you know we talked about our homes being somewhere that should nurture us and should support our healing and i think that's universal for anybody Uh, whether you've had an illness or not i think we are all living in very strange times we all know the uh, influence of social media, the influence of technology, you know, 24-7 information. And we're becoming, I see a lot more and more disconnected from our family, our friends, the world around us. So what can we do? And for me, I'm going to put some things into place this weekend from what I've just spoken to Emily about. She's really inspired me to think about calm space and a calm mind. So I'm thinking very positively about making some changes in my own home. Um, about a a space that nurtures me because I think that is the ultimate act of self-care we all need to nurture ourselves love ourselves a little bit more and why not start with loving our home and creating space around us that really supports us whatever we want in life whatever our goals are whether it's health goals whatever goals you've got creating the right environment around you is, is key to that and I think Emily can help you I'm going to put some links into her Facebook group which I'm going to join uh, her socials I know she's quite active on social media on Instagram and um, you can get in touch with Emily if you want to but just think this weekend maybe on the next few days about what is your space like that you're living in and um, does it support you does it help you are you frustrated with it do you want to make some changes because that is such an empowering thing to do And if it feels very overwhelming, you know, my top tip is always start small, just do one thing, set a timer maybe for 20 minutes and do some decluttering or just sort out one area, tidy your desk, tidy your sock drawer, whatever it is, start small and hopefully the energy and the um, encouragement that that will give you, sense of fulfilment will inspire you to do some more. The other thing that Emily talked about was that, you know, all the different spectrum things, you know, that she talked about. I'm still struggling a little bit with some of these, the ADHD, the autism. The fact that many people around us struggle to communicate doesn't mean always (laughs) that they are bad people or having a go at us. And I think sometimes in relationships, particularly in families, lack of communication can be such a bad thing. So 
My message is create a, a calm space and a calm mind. Get yourself right. Think about your communication with other people. Thank you so much, Emily. I absolutely love this week's podcast. I'm going to listen to it, I think, a couple of times because she gave us so many gems of information. So thank you, as always, for listening to Confidence After Cancer podcast. It means a lot to me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the guests that I've had on in the last few weeks. If you'd like me to have a particular guest or talk about a particular topic, get in touch with me. As always, I'd love to hear from you. And stay safe, stay sane, and take care. Thank you, my love. Bye-bye.